Shalom. We are back in our study of the book of Revelation, and we're on week 15 this week, even though we've been several weeks not doing it as we went through the High Holy Days. I wanted to uh, remind everybody watching online and those that will be watching in the next few days uh, that we are collecting goods for people in Panama City, Port St. Joe, Bay County, Gulf County, and up through uh, the lower Georgia area, and we're dispersing goods. You can make donations by bringing stuff, goods that are listed on our website, shalompensacola.com, to the synagogue, uh, or you can make cash donations directly through our website uh, and you, you know send uh, digital donations on that. And all of that, 100% of the money that comes in is going directly to uh, meet the needs for these people. So please make arrangements to come by and drop off the items. We're having a group go over on Sunday, which will be delivering the items directly to family and friends of uh, people from our community here. And then if, as they have enough and all, we'll go out towards uh, and beyond to, uh, to the area. So that's shalompensacola.com for those that wanna make uh, digital donations or just come by the synagogue at 6700 Spanish Trail and drop off your uh, stuff Monday through Thursday and if you're going to deliver, want to deliver on Friday, you have to make special arrangements. And please turn your cell phones off before study starts so that that doesn't happen. You would think we would know that by now. We are. It's like the lifeline. The cell phone's off, I can't breathe. So, okay. We're going to start in chapter 14 because that's where we left off. I always like to try to repeat the last couple of slides and then dig into uh, the next slide. So chapter 14 of the book of Revelation, beginning verse 12. Here is the perseverance of the Kiddushim. The word Kiddushim in Hebrew is equivalent to the word saints or separated ones, holy ones. Uh, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua. And I highlighted those differently because it's important that we remember that we're in the fifth, uh, 14th chapter of the book of Revelation and we're still dealing with the people of God keeping the commandments and the faith of Yeshua. It's important for us to note that because too many people today think that keeping the commandments isn't something we have to do anymore. We just have to have faith in Yeshua, that it's all about just faith in Yeshua, and you can live the way you want to or not want to or whatever, but you don't have to worry about the commandments. The commandments are that Old Testament stuff, and all we have to do is the New Testament stuff, but here we are in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation, and they're still talking about the perseverance or the stick to of the saints, of the believers, of the followers of Messiah, and he identifies them as those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua. And so that's a really important distinction that the identification marker of a saint, of a separated one, of one of the holy ones, is that they keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua. It's also important to note that it doesn't say the commandments of Yeshua. The reason I bring that up is there are those who teach that New Testament believers only have to keep the commandments of Yeshua, not the commandments of God. The commandments of God were the Old Testament. Now we just have to keep those commandments that Yeshua actually said. Uh, you know, they look at the verse that says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And they say, yeah, we only have to do the ones that Yeshua specifically said. But it's important, and by the way, I don't want to make a huge differentiation between God and Yeshua because Yeshua is God and, and so on. But I do want to say that, that in, in uh, making a, um, a clarity that this clearly doesn't say just the commands of Yeshua, as in New Testament people only have to do what Yeshua said and all those Old Testament commandments of God are done away with. Here we are in the book of Revelation in the midst of all that's going on and the identification marker of Kiddushim, of saints, of believers is 
keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua. And so uh, I, don't, I can't stress that hard enough because we need to understand that those, that's the same marker for us today. I mean, how close we are to these days, anybody can guess. You know, how, how long it is before the 14th chapter happens and the things we're talking about. But the identification marker of a follower of God has been the same continually. And it's faith in Yeshua and living a life of obedience to God's commandments. Not to be saved, but because we are saved. Remember, this is the perseverance of the saints. By definition, saints would be those that have been born again, those that are believers, those that are followers. So we start out with this is the perseverance of those who have been born again, of those that are saved or redeemed or whatever word we want to use for that. And how do we identify those people? They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua. It goes on to say, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, How fortunate are the dead, those who die in the Lord from now on, yes, says the Ruach, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. And again, we, we look at this and we say, well, when is this going to happen? What is this going on? And the answer is we really don't know. What we do know is that it's talking about those that are believers, that die in the Lord, and they're resting from their labors for their deeds follow them. And again, I know I sound redundant, redundantly, as I say this, but there's a clear expression of the importance of laborers, deeds, works, as an identifier of those who are in the Lord. And this is so important because many people today in uh, New Covenant or Apostolic writing believers, New Testament believers, in Yeshua don't believe that it's important for us to have good deeds or labors or works. That, you know, you're trying to work your way to salvation, and the truth is no one can work their way to salvation. But once you have a relationship with God, once you're born again, works should follow that. Your life should be an example of someone that has and is uh, following the ways of God. Revelation 14, 14. Then I looked, and behold, there was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man. He had a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. I always look at that, and I think, that would be an amazing picture to see. It's talking about Yeshua. Uh, one like the Son of Man, seated, has a crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to the one seated on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. In Daniel 7.13 it says, And I was watching in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man, coming in the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was brought into his presence never pass away and is never to pass away and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed it's clearly identifying and connecting the verse verses in revelation with this verse in daniel which is identifying yeshua as this one and uh, again it's important that we note these things the kingdom's never going to be passed away uh, are never going to pass away and that the harvest is fully ripe um it goes on to say, Dominion, glory, and sovereignty were given to him that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will, and, and I stopped it there for some reason. No, you just, you just exited in a different spot. If you like the other verse, you'll <coughs> That will. That will. Never pass away. Never pass away. Ah, I see what happened. Somebody messed up my slide. And when I find out who I did that, I'm going to get him. So anyhow, the point I want to make about this is that it's talking still, Daniel's talking about the same event that we read about in Revelation. 
and it's talking about all peoples, all nations, all languages serving him. And this is, um, again, people who are the holy ones, who follow the commandments and the faith of Yeshua. And so people who say those commandments are just for the Jews, the Gentiles don't have to follow commandments, and, and there's a separate way of living for Gentiles versus Jews. Now there are separate identifiers and roles for Jews and Gentiles, just like there are for men and women, just like there are for soldiers and non-soldiers, and farmers and non-farmers, and merchants and non-merchants. There's rules and, and, and laws and ordinances that apply to different people, different ways. There's laws for men that don't apply to women and laws for women that don't apply to men. But all of the commandments as a whole are one whole that applies to all peoples, all nations, and all languages. Now, when we say all peoples, all nations, all languages, we have to remember that when you say all, that means it includes Israel in there. So it's all, including Israel. And, uh, and, and again, that's important to, to remember because through Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. God's plan has always been that... Um, Jew and non-Jew would be unified in faith in him through Messiah, born again and walking in unity, one new man. And again, as we say one new man, as we say all these things, that doesn't mean that we become uh, robots and, and we suddenly go from being stones to bricks and everybody has to look exactly the same, talk exactly the same, dress exactly the same. This is not, you know... It always amazes me when you think about every old uh, space movie. Everybody's wearing the same clothes. You know, it, it's, 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 you know the, you, they go to another planet and everybody on the planet's wearing the same clothes. That's not what this is. It's not that everybody suddenly has to wear the same clothes, same look, same haircut, same hair color, same every, you know, it's just that's not what God's talking about. If it wasn't all nations, if it became just one nation, now we know that it's the commonwealth of Israel which is made up, but each nation has their own culture and their own identifiers, otherwise you wouldn't know they were a nation. There's nothing wrong with having separate nations and one kingdom. And that's what the Bible teaches. Separate nations, one kingdom. So if somebody is from Japan... There's nothing wrong with them holding on to their cultural Japanese ways as long as those ways don't contradict the scripture. So we have to make choices. How do we adapt our culture to God's scripture? Not how do we adapt scripture to our culture. And too often that's what's happened. We've adapted the scripture to culture instead of adapting our culture to scripture and pairing away those things which would be uh, contrary to God's word. And again, all languages will should serve him. I love that, that God's plan was not just that he would come to save the Jewish people. Matter of fact, I was reading uh, Jonah. Again, I'm, I'm preparing for a message that I'm going to give at the conference down in December. And I'm getting a head start. I'm so proud of myself. But I'm going to teach about Jonah because Jonah is a Jewish guy who gets sent to a Gentile nation and is angry about it because God is sending him to the Gentiles to share the message of repentance. And I know some within the Messianic movement that unfortunately aren't interested in sharing the good news with Gentiles. You know, they say, I'm called only to Israel. My calling is only to Israel. I'm just about the Jewish people. If Gentiles show up, great, but it's not. But my Bible doesn't teach that. It, it just doesn't. And, and I think in some ways the Messianic movement has become like Jonah. You know, Jonah wasn't in rebellion against God in his whole life, and there's no evidence that Jonah had fallen away from the Lord. The Lord called him to go minister and go share. But he got upset when he was sent to a Gentile nation. And he said, I don't want to go to a Gentile nation. I'll go the other way. And I think that we as, as Messianic believers, both Jew and Gentile, need to kind of get the message of Jonah. 
Jonah actually got mad that God was going to save Gentiles. He said, you know, I'm going to go there and preach. You're not going to destroy them. You're telling me to go say that you're going to destroy their nation, but you're not going to do it. I'm going to go there and preach. They're going to change. They're going to repent. I know they're going to do that, and I know you're going to forgive them. And I don't want that to happen. One kingdom, many nations. One new man, Jew and non-Jew. Gentiles don't become Jews. Jews don't become Gentiles. It's not necessary. I've said before, I coined the term trans-Jutile. trans is a Gentile who believes they were born in the wrong genealogy. And that's not what God's about. He's, he didn't make mistakes when he made people. Every one of you was fearfully and wonderfully made. And God didn't make a mistake. He didn't go, oops, I'm sorry. Dropped them in the wrong bin. You know? It's not how it was done. And so if you were born a Gentile, there's a role for you as a Gentile within the commonwealth of Israel. And if you're born Jewish, there's a role for you within the commonwealth of Israel. You don't have to, like, stop being who God created you to be. You have to find your role within the community and walk it out faithfully. Revelation 14, 16. So the one seated on the cloud swung a sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Mm -hmm. um, then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who had authority over the fire, came out from the altar. And he called with a loud voice to the one holding the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sickle and gather the grape clusters from the vineyard of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and gathered the clusters from the vineyard of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. That doesn't sound pleasant. It just doesn't. And the winepress was stomped on the outside of the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as the horse's bridle for 1600 stadia. That's a long distance in case you were wondering. A stadia is a stadium. And if you do it, that's 1,600 stadiums long. It's a huge distance that goes on. I want to say there's some discussion about all this because there's people that believe pre-trib and people that believe post-trib. There's people that look at the verses that say, you know, man and wife asleep in bed, one is taken, one's left, two men in the field, one is taken, one is left. If you read all of it, you'll find that in the way the context reads, the ones that are taken are not the good ones. The ones that are left are the good ones. So being left behind is not a bad thing, biblically. And so deciding what he's talking about here in this harvest and what is being burnt up, what is being pressed, and what is being done uh, is important. And we're not going to spend a lot of time digging into it because there's all kinds of disagreement about that. And I told you at the beginning that I was not going to parse out things that are not plain and, and we know this is exactly this. But it is important to that we should get in our minds that uh, the, the, the words that are used about the harvest and about taking and, and all that, uh, we tend to read them backwards more often than we do the correct way and understand that uh, that it, the scripture talks about the ones that are left being the blessed ones uh, now that doesn't mean at the destruction of the world and all that but you know first you take out and then you have the the harvest that comes up I do know this that I don't want to be involved in this whole wrath of the wine press. I also know that this is at the what we would call the end of the situation. There's tribulation and then there's wrath. And the scripture says we're not appointed to wrath, but it does clearly say we'll deal with tribulation. In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And uh, if you don't believe that, the easiest way to get clarity is to speak to an Iraqi Christian or a Syrian Christian or an Egyptian Christian 
who are being put to death, people in Africa that are being put to death for their faith right now. Uh, have a chat with the uh, pastor that just was released from Turkey and see if, uh, if he believes that we're not going to have any tribulation on this side of, of the rapture or the calling away of God's people. It's a really hard thing, but we look at most of the Bible as Americans. We are a, a very proud people. Um, and, and that's not necessarily bad that we have some pride in our nation uh, if it's kept in the right way. We should be uh, pleased with our blessings and, and what God has done and, and that we have had a, a positive impact in the world and in ways. We also have had a negative impact in the world, and we need to be honest about that also. Uh, but we tend to look at the scriptures, especially the end-time prophecy, as if it's talking about the United States. And so when something happens, we go, well, where, how's that fit in the United States? Well, the truth is it may not fit at all in the United States. It's written about Israel and the nations around Israel. And so when we look at that, we have to look at it in that way. So when we look at what's going on in Syria and Egypt and Iraq and Iran and Jordan and Lebanon, uh, and the Christian, and even in uh, Israel, in the areas that are run by the Arabs, where they're persecuting. But Bethlehem had 80,000 Christians living in Bethlehem just a short few years ago. Now there's less than 8,000 living there because of persecution. And so we need to be aware that when we look at these verses, we have to look at them as if we're standing in Israel. And reading them in that context, not standing in Pensacola or Washington or New York or any place else. And so when we look at the, the words of tribulation and all these things, it's happening now. And, and if your eyes are open, you can't miss the persecution. I mean, when they're putting believers in cages and drowning them or burning them up because they won't recant their faith. You can pretty well file that in the file of tribulation. And we need to be aware of that. Okay, Revelation 15, 1. What time is it? 7, 10. Okay. Then I saw another great and wonderful sign in heaven. Seven angels who had seven plagues. The last ones, for with them God's wrath is finished. And again, I was saying that what we're talking about at the end of chapter 14 is the end of that season it's when God's wrath is falling and here we pick up from that same place where the the last ones uh, for with them God's wrath is finished it's interesting that it says a great and wonderful sign because very few of us would really use the word wonderful in terms of the wrath of God um, it, it doesn't you know comport with our normal use of the word wonderful. Wonderful would be, you know, a baby being born or a beautiful wedding or something like that. Uh, but the, this term wonderful, a sign in heaven, the seven angels who have seven plagues and the last ones for with them, God's wrath is finished. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire and those who had overcome the beast and his image and the number of his name standing by the sea of glass holding the harps of God. And they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and wonderful are your deeds, Adonai Elohei Sebaot, just and true are of your ways, O King of the nations. These are songs we sing on Shabbat. Uh, and this song of Moses, remember the end of Moses's time on earth he writes the last pages of Deuteronomy the song of Moses and Moses was a prophet we don't often think of him that way but when we're talking about Yeshua it says he will be a prophet like Moses was and so when we read the song of Moses it's a song of prophecy of what's going to be happening in the end and so these people are singing that song as it's taking place on the earth. And they're singing it 
the song of, Mo uh, of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And they're saying, great and wonderful are your deeds. Now, how does that fit with God's wrath? Because we have difficulty with that. Uh, I don't know about you, but I have difficulty sometimes saying, how do we rejoice in what's happening while knowing that the wrath of God is what's happening? But the truth is that if we know what the scripture says, that everybody that falls under the wrath of God had a chance, a choice, an opportunity. So there shouldn't be a reason for us not to be rejoicing in the fullness of God's promise because the only ones that are not in there are the ones that made the choice not to serve God, not to believe in Yeshua, not to follow in that way. And God's ways are always true, just, pure, righteous, loving, kind, and wonderful. And we'll have that understanding when this happens. It won't be a wrestling match in our minds because we'll have the full understanding of what's happening and we'll be viewing it through that righteous lens. Yes? What about um, like your um, So I'm going to repeat for the people that can't hear you on the video. What about someone who has a spouse or a family member that's not a believer? How do they rejoice? When you, um, when you look through the lens of God's righteousness, then you know everything he does is good. And so you, you don't judge by your heart. Our hearts are desperately wicked. We make the wrong decision if we follow our heart almost every time. So we can't judge by our feelings. We can't rule by our feelings. We have to rule by God's word, by his righteousness, by what he does. And, and when this is going on, we will be. We'll be looking at it from that way. Now, that doesn't mean that, um, that like we should look at it now and say, you know, look at, you know, if you're, you're married and your wife is not a believer and go, ah, I'm going to heaven, you're going to hell, and I'm going to rejoice. That's not what we're talking about here uh, we should do everything within our power and ability to share the good news to live the good news to encourage them to serve the Lord to reach out we don't do that a, a lot of times we th sometimes we think we do sometimes we say we do uh, but the truth is very few of us uh, myself included love God with all our heart soul mind and strength um, because we do all kinds of things that if we were honest with ourselves, we probably wouldn't do. We say things we wouldn't say. We go places we wouldn't go. You know, I, I had a, uh, a sign once that I put on my television that said, would God watch this with me? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, so you look at it, would God watch this with me? Uh, it'll change your, your TV habits. If you say, you know, if, if, because the truth is he is. He's everywhere. It's not like when you close your bedroom door, God's no longer in the room. You don't have one of those, like in a hospital where you close the door and it sucks all the air out. And it's feeding separate air into the room. God is everywhere. And so when we watch something on TV or we read a book we shouldn't read or we listen to something we shouldn't listen to. We go somewhere we shouldn't go. Um, and then we say, well, I'm loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, we we kind of self-deceive sometimes. And we have to be careful about that because when we do those things, our loved ones that we're saying aren't yet believers are watching us to see just how real we are about our faith. And how we live out our faith and what we do. That doesn't mean, by the way, that we have to be miserable all the time. 
Faith in God is not equal to misery. It's equal to joy and peace and comfort and happiness and all those things. But people do watch us. I was uh, talking to Stan and Joyce earlier, and I said this week I had a wrestling match, and I'm not going to go into what it was, but somebody had done something. I wasn't happy with it. Uh, I thought they were not smart for doing what they did and showed bad judgment, and, and so I wanted to, uh, to social media them because that's how we show our displeasure today. And I wanted to call them and yell at them. I wanted to call their family and yell at their family. I wanted to, uh, but had I done that uh, at that moment, there's no way they would have seen me as a child of God demonstrating love and mercy and grace. That doesn't mean um, that we compromise things. But we have to stop and think. You know, I, I tell people when my older brother uh, would get mad at us, he would uh, quite often, you know, beat on us. And uh, when he got old enough to get a motorcycle, uh, my father said, if I catch you hitting any of your brothers, I'm going to take your motorcycle away for a week. And so then we would annoy him in some way, and he would... <laughs> I mean, sometimes on purpose, sometimes not, honestly. But and he would come after us, and we I'd say, stop and count to 10, M-O-T-O-R-C-Y-C-L-E, because there's 10 letters in motorcycle. <laughs> and, and then he would think about it and say, you know, is beating him worth <coughs> losing my motorcycle? Sometimes it was. <laughs> but... We need to really think about our actions in real terms like that. Uh, it's the same way I was talking earlier in a meeting. When people do things, I write emails. Anybody write emails to people? You get upset, you write them a nice long email. And then I print it, and then I put it in a drawer. And then I pull it out the next day, and I read it. And then I usually crumble it up and write what I should write. And then I put that in the drawer. <laughs> and sometimes it takes two or three days. So if it takes two or three days for me to reply to an email to you, <laughs> just know the first couple of them went in the drawer. And, uh, but because it wouldn't be presenting God. Now, I would hope that at some point I mature to the point where I respond in the correct way in every um, experience and circumstance. I, I'm getting better. Uh, I'm maturing slowly. I am a man, and thus I'm hard-headed. But uh, we need to understand that when we say love God with all our heart, mind, and, uh, mind, and strength, uh, it, we rarely fully do that. And so because we don't do that, we are not the witness and the example of God's grace and mercy and love that we should be. And so we need to learn to adjust those things. And that's part of that keeping the commandments of God because all of those bad attitudes are violating God's commandments. You know, that whole love your neighbor as yourself thing comes to mind. You know, I like the sign that says love your neighbor as yourself. I'm not kidding. God. You know those billboards that were used to be up and down the highway? You used to love those things. Anyhow, so back to this. I know that was a long deviation, but I kind of felt like it was what the Lord had us to do. Yes, ma'am. Studying about that culture being an honor and shame culture, that it does say great and wonderful are your deeds because God alone has the mind, the heart to recompense the wrongs and to bring honor back to his name to remove the shame of Right, we have to remember, very good points, because the way God does, um, if God says he's going to do something, and he doesn't do it, he 
He's not God. Amen. So, one of the ways that God demonstrates his power is by doing things that we notice are judgments. And then we look and say, wow, that was God doing exactly what he said he was going to do. And then we can rejoice in our God, not in the judgment. Does that make sense? And so I don't know about you, and, and this I think it's probably close to 730. But I want to close with this. I look at my life and I see many times where God brought situations in my life that were not pleasant to me, to chastise me, to put me back in line like a loving father does to his children. And I can rejoice in those things. Now, I can tell you I didn't always rejoice in them when they were happening. But I can look back and see that. That's the same as when I joined in the, in the Navy. I was 16. I joined the Navy, and I went off. And I realized I was sitting there one day, and I realized where I would have been if my stepfather had not come into my life and brought the hammer down. Because my brothers and I were headed to jail. I mean, we were not. My mom was a single mom. She worked two jobs. She wasn't around the house. We were latchkey kids. And uh, we were doing all kinds of things that uh, were headed in the wrong direction. And my stepfather came in and he laid down the law. And, uh, you know, while it was happening, I was not at all pleased. You know, I mean, there were several times that we had words. He, he had words and deeds. I had words. He was bigger than me. I wanted to have words and deeds, but he was bigger than me. And uh, But when I look back as a 16-year-old in the Navy and realized that I would not have been where I was if it wasn't for him doing that, I wrote him a letter thanking him for the tribulation that he brought into my life, which lined me back up to where I could have. And I wouldn't go to jail and, and, and those things, which is where I honestly was headed, uh, along with my brothers and most of my friends. So uh, we can look at God's wrath as evidence of God's perfect, fulfilled promises, because all of his promises are good. All of his promises are not pleasant. And we're going to close there. Hit the switch.